story about diversity and inclusion is how after being really underpaid at the startup where I worked, I had to ask for money, not one, more money, not once, but three times. So you can imagine that third time I was all but screaming at my boss, who used to say no one should ever have to ask for more. So fortunately, he fixed it. But despite this experience, and at the time I felt like, oh my god, this is the worst thing ever. This epitomizes everything that's wrong with tech and being a woman in tech. But in reality, I did have enough class privilege and financial security from my parents that this experience stung, but it didn't hurt. And when the startup was acquired, that kind of made up for things. And these privileges became starkly clear when I was working on a six-month volunteer project with AbleWorks, which is a financial literacy and life skills organization based in East Palo Alto. And their clients included low-income high school students and parents who really needed to increase their incomes. And my team was trying to figure out if and how their clients could access the Silicon Valley economy. My initial thought was that startups would be perfect. You know, based on my own experience, I knew that they could value creativity and hard work more than credentials or the resume. But as I talked to um, these women more who were incredibly motivated, smart, driven, it was clear that uh, they were outside of our recruiting profile and we were outside of theirs as well. And even at a bigger company that might have had more hiring resources, you know, my friends who worked at Facebook were marketers or PMs or engineers. Their friends are working in um, low paying custodial jobs that were contract based and still more of their friends were thinking about moving away to the Central Valley because they were tired of living in someone's garage with their children. And I highlight this story as a reminder that there's another story about diversity and inclusion that's happening beyond our bubble. And I want to share, uh, or it, and this story is not just about teaching more people how to code. I really believe it's about social justice. And I want to share another strategy which is about investing our time, money, resources, and advocacy within our local communities who, um, and with organizations who are at the front lines of fighting the inequities like the ones that I mentioned. A lot of people ask me, why should I care about my local community? Because they see giving as this optimization problem that had, should have some ROI based on the most lives saved. But in actuality, there are significant problems right here in our own back, backyards, and the data shows that race really matters, from the fact that the poverty rate for black and brown people is one and a half to two times higher, that we see similar um, challenges for unemployment, even when you control for education. We all complain about our rent being expensive, but 58% or more of black and brown residents um, who are renting are rent burdened. But even beyond there being challenges, there's also a huge opportunity here as well. The San Francisco Foundation recently commissioned a report done by PolicyLink that found that there's actually a $117 billion economic opportunity from achieving racial equity here in our region. And there are already so many organizations making a dent in these challenges, but we see that, see that they often lack the resources to achieve their goals. What that looks like is that 80% of Silicon Valley nonprofits are reporting an increase in demand, of which 50% believe they won't meet it. And contrast that with the fact that only 3% of giving from Silicon Valley gift, uh, zip codes um, goes to these community-based organizations. And in fact, 93% of that giving leaves the region completely. And I hear time and time again that community-based organizations really want to reach us, but there are vast translation gaps. Everything from tech donors expecting an abundance of data that actually needs to be collected from humans, not from logging button taps, to um, activists also being resentful of um, tech workers or tech salaries impact on rent prices. So when I talk to nonprofits, you know, we all joke about living in a bubble, but on the outside that bubble isn't even see-through. 
And I often wonder, where are the tech people who care? Because I've encountered a lot of them, but it often feels really hard to find each other. And I think many of them are right here in this room, advocating within diversity and inclusion spaces. And I think there's so much synergy between DNI work within tech and equity within our larger communities. And so many people have told me about that one or two coworkers who just doesn't get it. And I wonder a lot if community work um, it offers a chance to convince people that there's value in this work. And from what I can tell, it seems like tech people really want to be there as well. Um, three years ago, I helped co-found an organization called y -Core. Um, we're mobilizing tech people and resources um, and putting them to work within our communities. So in that time, we've activated 130 young professionals who've delivered a million dollars in value um, through projects to 23 community-based nonprofits, and we've reached over 1,000 people at events. And this is just within one organization. But beyond that, all of my friends are quitting their jobs every couple of years, and they're telling me they're doing it because they want more meaning and impact. And I wonder, why aren't they getting that at work? For me, what, um, starting y -Core and running it on the side for two years before ultimately leaving um, and making my, it my full-time job kept me at that company one to two years longer than I would have otherwise. And the number one complaint that I hear from people in talking about um, getting more involved is not, why should I do this, or why is this worth my time, but I don't know where to start, which tells me that the opportunities that are out there around like drop-in volunteering don't seem to take advantage of people's skills and desire to do more. But what does it actually look like to build effective community partnerships? Because of course there's lots of risk around you know, not being the tech saviors that we all want to be careful of. The first step is accurately locating our wealth and privilege for those of us whom this applies to. According to Resource Generation, you actually only need to make $105,000 to land in the top 10% of incomes nationwide for 18 to 35 year olds. Um, and those of us in either high paying or even influential roles like engineering or product really need to stop saying I'm not rich. The second is that time builds trust. Our fellows commit five hours per week um, over four months to nonprofit projects and to our educational workshops. And we find time and time again that it's that the showing up and the commitment that unlocks meteor challenges that um, allows participants to take advantage of their skills and allows us to, to deliver or be more likely to deliver real value to our partners. We also hear that a lot of people come in saying, I want to make a tangible impact. But what matters more, actually, at the early stages of someone's involvement is actually um, connection to real people and practitioners, not those impact numbers. Getting to know people at nonprofits or their clients, once you've developed that trust and that commitment, allows people to feel like they're part of the work. And it also allows them a chance to understand what's going on and what are the real challenges out there in our communities so much better. One of our project leads once told me that this work is hard with a capital H. I think um, somebody earlier spoke to burnout being a real thing. And we identify with that really strongly as well. And so we think it's so important to take the time to reflect, to learn, to try to better understand social systems and reflect on the role that we play in our larger community outside of our bubble. This makes taking action so much more sustainable. And last but not least, to speak up in whatever big or small way makes sense for you. One question I hear, or two questions I hear way too often are things like, can I talk about social impact at work? Or can I fundraise for my coworkers? 
I personally left tech because I underestimated the power of one-to-one -one conversations. And it took me three years, actually, to realize that I should have spent more time at the lunch table or having those one-on-one -on -one touch points because sometimes I was the only person a friend or coworker had who knew about this larger world beyond our bubble. And even though it can be scary to share what we believe, to share what we're learning, I encourage you to find those small ways um, to start doing that. Right now, I'm working to scale y -Corps to the South Bay and eventually to other cities, but my greater vision is actually a multiracial movement of tech people who are organizing their friends, family, and coworkers, and I don't think that this vision needs to be for my organization only. The tech sector has already proven that it can reshape the fabric of our communities, and I've already seen so many powerful tools being built with or without funding to serve people and organizations in need. But there's one piece that's missing that has a huge potential, and that's when our sector reaches beyond this bubble that we exist within and applies our diversity and inclusion principles and our human capital right here in our communities, and I hope that you'll join me in doing so. Thank you. Hi. Um, firstly, thank you so much for the talk, and thank you so much for the great work you're doing for the local communities. Um, as one of those people who views charity as an optimization problem, um, I found the, the idea of like focusing on local communities really interesting. And I'm wondering what you think the balance is between you know, our responsibility to use our privilege to help people in you know, Africa, for example, compared to like focusing on our local communities here. Uh, so the question was about um, charity being an optimization problem or not, and how to balance our giving between where we live and the really big challenges in, say, developing regions like in Africa. Um, and the thing that I like to point out is that it's not always an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Um, the problems that people face in different regions are just different, and we can't ignore the fact that we live here, we participate in these communities, even if we don't always feel like we're very deeply connected to them. We benefit from a lot of the social systems here that um, exclude a lot of people. So I don't always have an answer to, you know, how to optimize your giving, because again, I don't believe that it's such an optimization, but I would challenge everybody to, to consider your role here and what you can do here as part of your larger giving um, story, too. And, and, and to not think about it in terms of how much do I give or what's that number I want to reach, but to challenge yourself to give a little bit more. There's not going to be a perfect number necessarily, especially for people who are early in their journey. And what I like to challenge myself to do is get to the point where it's a little bit uncomfortable, where I'm really challenging myself to go a couple steps further than is easy for me. Hi, my name's Alberto, I'm Latino, so I wanna thank you for highlighting the needs of the Latino community and what you and your organization are doing. My question is um, more uh, uh, specific to the underrepresented, underrepresented communities and individuals within the Asian and South Asian communities, mm -hmm. even here in Silicon Valley, where we hear that you know after white men that the Asian communities are doing okay. You know, let, let's set aside gender for now. But I'm curious more about the underrepresented communities within those Asian, South Asian, let's say for Pakistan or Laos or so on. Has anyone looked into what their needs are and how they're doing and are th uh, what opportunities are there to help those communities? I think, uh, so the question was about um, Asian American communities and especially um, underrepresented Asian American minorities and um, what data is out there. And you bring up a really good point because so often um, Asian Americans are just lumped into this single group when in fact there's so much diversity of class, income, experience, even within y -Core, we're about 80% um, people of color, most of whom are Asian American, but within those Asian Americans, there's so much diversity of experience, and um, I don't have an answer to what the data actually looks like, but I think you bring up a really good point that 
um, we can't always just lump every group together without considering that there are always going to be different experiences based on income and class as well. Hi. Um, so I identify as like an East Asian, um, like queer woman of color. Well, non-binary. It's it's complicated, um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, I think it's like it's interesting for me to see you um, like on this stage, especially as someone who like um, like someone who basically looks like me. It's like whoa, um, <laughs> and I and I think to me like um, I guess my question is is that um, like. I guess, I guess the question that I have is that um, when you have conversations with people in tech who decide to make their decisions based on ideologies that are kind of related to like, you know, capitalism and like optimizing technolo technological profit, um, you know, propping up their portfolios um, and not thinking so much about the land that they're taking up and the space that they're taking up and the money that they're using and like which resources they have. How do you have these conversations? Because for me, like with an activist background, I can say all this stuff very directly. And in, and in the space, I feel comfortable enough to say this. But when you're talking, especially as representation for YCOR, with the, with the tech people that you're talking to, how do you navigate these conversations? Uh, so the question was around, um, how do you navigate conversations with tech people who um, may not always, or, or maybe more capitalism focused or metrics focused or not thinking as much about the nuances of, of um, their impact, the impact that their products have on other people. Um, I say it's really hard. I'm still practicing, to be honest, and I'm a little bit lucky in that a lot of the conversations that I'm having are people coming to me because they want, they have lots of questions. Um, and what I think I try to do is, um, if I'm in these more challenging conversations, to ask lots of questions to figure out, okay, where is somebody's race or class analysis? How much do they know? Um, I studied race and ethnicity in college, and, and I just assumed that everybody understood that systemic racism was a thing, for example, <laughs> or that, that sexism were what was things, and, and a lot of people don't actually know, and it's really hard to have a conversation if somebody's not on the same page, and identifying kind of what point they're at, what they might know or accept, or what might be more challenging, helps me frame what I say. Um, sometimes I see my job as just to expose people to what's out there, and I never feel like I can change somebody's mind, although I would love to sometimes. Um, but acknowledging that, you know, I have information to share, but it might not reach them um, fully, and trying to address that based on where, they are, where they're at in their own understanding, I think helps kind of ground me in, in my expectations. This is a really quick one. Is Y Corp 501c3 nonprofit? We are. And how can we give you money? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can um, go to our website, ycor.org slash donate. Uh, we're also an organization run by and for millennials, so we have a Venmo at YCOR. <laughs> but <laughs> if you use that, please put your address and email address in the comments so we can acknowledge um, you for your tax uh, write-off. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.